welcome to Church Alive. We are so glad that you're able to join us today. If you'd like more information on us as a church, how to give, and our available resources, then make sure you head over to our website. I hope that you enjoy today's message. Good morning once again. So good. So you can take your seats. Sure, that was, that was really, really good. I, I don't know what I'm doing up here. I think we should just go home now. I think that is so much to chew on. That was absolutely amazing. I'm so encouraged by that. And uh, you know what I'm encouraged with most is that the things that make the biggest difference in a spiritual world are the simple things in life. It's not complicated. So uh, are you guys ready for a little bit more? Come on, nudge your neighbor. Just wake them up quickly. All right. Today I'm going to bring you the penultimate, that's such a nice word, penultimate message in our series, Kingdom People, Kingdom Purpose. And today I want to talk to you about the power of patience. The power of patience. How many of you need help in the area of patience? Come on. Come on. All right, just kind of keep your hands up there. Keep, come on, keep your hands up there because there are those people who are prepared to admit they need patience and then there are those who lie. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So of, of those of you who raised your hands, how many of you have got either toddlers or teenagers in your house? Raise your hands again. Yeah, it's about the same number of people. There's definitely a color, a color, 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 coral. Correl Correl thank you. Correlation. <laughs> patience, patience. By the way, I'm not going to talk to you about the power of procrastination. <laughs> There's a difference between the two. Very, very clear. Some people who are procrastinators go, and no, I'm just being patient. No, you're not. It's, 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 it's like hoarders who call themselves collectors. <laughs> no, no, you're not a collector. You're a hoarder. Come on, face up to the truth, shame the devil. <laughs> All right. I'm not talking about procrastination, I'm talking about patience. 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 I'm going to go back to the, to the passage that Pastor Debbie read. I'm going to read just the one verse, Isaiah 40 verse 31, and this is from a different translation. It goes like this. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. When I read this, I thought to myself, why is it that we are so impatient in life? Isn't it true? We, at some level, we all struggle with a little bit of impatience. Why are we so impatient? And I looked at this verse and I thought to myself, perhaps the reason why we struggle with impatience is because we are waiting for stuff. We're waiting for things to happen we're waiting for a breakthrough. We're waiting for him. We're waiting for her. We're waiting for that raise. We're waiting for things in life to change. When Isaiah says, the problem is, and this is why you are getting impatient, because you are relying on things that are as material as you are. You shouldn't be waiting for things for people. You should be waiting for the Lord. It's a shift of focus. Not waiting for something to happen. Get your, it will happen when we shift our focus away from the thing, the person we get impatient about, and we focus our gaze on the Lord. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Luke records Jesus' words to his disciples after his resurrection in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Look at this. He says, And while staying with them, Jesus ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait. Wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And of course, he was making reference to uh, the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down and the church was born. But they needed to wait. 
Now, there seems to be a little bit of a contradiction here. There's like this tension that's created here because I don't know if you guys can remember when uh, I spoke to you uh, during the Easter weekend, we spoke about uh, the ladies going to the grave and the first thing the angel says to them is this, or, or when they encounter Jesus, actually, he said this to them, go to my brothers and tell them to get a move on to meet me in Galilee. Do you remember that? And there's this tension here because first he tells them, you need to move. And now he's met with them and now he tells them, wait. You gotta move, you gotta wait. You gotta move, you gotta wait. There's this tension that is created here and it almost seems like a contradiction. Last week, I spoke to you about our purpose and God's promise being discovered on the move. This week, I'm telling you, you need to stop and wait. What is happening here? Some, somebody some time ago said to me, you Christians are crazy. He said, when it comes to the whole sex thing, oh my word, before marriage, it's like, no, no sex, no sex, wait, no sex. You have sex before marriage, you're gonna go straight to hell, right? And then suddenly, when you get married, just have sex, have sex, have more sex, or you're gonna go to hell, you know? <laughs> what is happening here? Like, you guys are crazy. But I said, you know, I, I think there's, there's a misunderstanding. Because often what you discover uh, in Scripture, in life, in just our experience of life, is that the call to move, the call to go, is often preceded by a season of no. What we need to get our heads around is why is that like that? Let me say that again. The call to go is often preceded by a season of no, a call to wait patiently. This week in your life groups, you will watch session five in the series, Your Time Is Now. And in this session, Jonathan Evans talks about how Paul the Apostle had to recognize that his time in prison was not the end of his journey. And that as he sat in prison trying to process what is happening here, the Spirit of God begins to speak to him and talks to him and say, there's a reason why you're here. You are waiting. Your best is yet to come. But you are waiting here. And, and it's not going to look like you think it will. You think it will. Do you know that Paul wrote some of his greatest letters while he was in prison? And you know what, the, the Bible is not very explicit about this, but when I look at Paul's life, I think he was quite a driven guy. He was like a little bit of an A-type personality. Both before he, he served Christ and after he served Christ, he was that like typical driver kind of personality. You know what I'm talking about? Are you, are you, do you know people like that? Are you married to one? Pray for me. All right, so... And the Bible doesn't explicitly say so, but I think there were moments when God looked at Paul and said, you're going too fast. You, you, you want to run ahead. And so I, I, I need to do something. You see, here's the thing. Whether we're on the move and God says stop or whether we're procrastinating and God says you need to get a move on, both, in both those places, the Spirit of God is too kind and too loving to us to leave us there. And so we've seen it throughout the series as well. There are moments when God says, you need to move, but we don't want to move. We, there's fear, we're scared, I don't, whatever it is, we're just rebellious. God says, move, I need you to move, and we don't move. And then the Spirit comes here, now I'm going to make you move. That's what he did in the early church, right, in Acts. They were very happy in their huddle. And then persecution comes, says, you need to go. Jesus said, you need to go, but we don't want to go. It's nice here. So, well, then I'm going to make you go. And there are times when we're on the move and God says, I need you to slow down. You're going too fast. Your character is not ready for where you want to step into yet. 
and I need you to slow down. And when that doesn't happen, God does the same thing. He says, I love you too much to keep you on the move. So what I'm going to do is like a mother or a child would do when a toddler doesn't want to sit still. They pick them up, they hold them, and that child, come on, you, if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. It's like, get me out of here. I want to move. I want to. No, I love you too much to let you go. Because I know if I let you go now, you're going to hurt yourself and probably somebody else. You need to learn to wait patiently. You see, here's the key. That the movement and the waiting are not mutually exclusive. They are actually two essential parts of the same journey. You and I need to be discerning to be able to understand, am, am, I, am I required right now to get a move on? Am I procrastinating? Or am I in a space where I need to slow down? Where I need to slow down. Either way, if I don't listen, God is a great father and he's going to help me. And sometimes the help is not always comfortable. How many of you know that? Somebody who found himself in that space is a very famous Bible character. He was a, he was a, a mover and a shaker. And God wanted him to slow down because God had a very specific purpose for his life, but he wouldn't slow down enough. He made life all about him, all about his pace, all about his goals, his dreams. Uh, in fact, he made it about his good looks and about his muscles. Anybody know who I'm talking about? His name was Samson. Samson was actually a judge. He's not one of my favorite Bible characters, but he's one of the most popular. It's one of the first characters we learn about in kids' church, <laughs> right? It's Samson. So you can go read about Samson's life story in Judges 13 to 16. I'm, gonna go, I'm not going to go to the whole story today, but make a note of that. Go and read his story. It is incredible. Here's the thing. Uh, Samson, as far as Bible characters are concerned, he was probably the closest to being a biblical Marvel superhero. He literally had a superpower. He had superhuman strength. It was, it was an incredible gift God gave him. He had superhuman physical strength. He has the problem. He, he grew up and he became a moron with muscles. <laughs> Samson suffered from roid rage. <laughs> Do you know somebody like that? Go on. I'm, I'm getting a scratch here. Is, are, are we okay? Are we okay? I might uh, need a handout, but let's, let's see how it goes. So Samson struggles. He struggles with his own ego. He is narcissistically self-centered. But you need to understand, he wasn't born like that. No moron is born like that. <laughs> but on the flip side of that coin, no righteous person are born righteous either. We become in life what our choices allow us to and what our community forms us into. That's why what I think, uh, what Debbie spoke about here this morning is so critical and so important because you and I need to be involved in the lives of our children. The reason why we did this morning what we did publicly is because it's not just you. We, we could have a private time with with the parents on their own and just pray for them and kind of, you know, not waste your time. But it's important that we do this publicly because you're involved. You're involved. When we do this, we make a commitment to one another that as a community, we will raise our families together. We will be there for one another. But Samson got himself in a space where he was completely self-focused. He was completely rebellious. And I think just reading between the lines again, I think his parents didn't help. I think they spoiled him. He was this kid with this great gift, and uh, it, it, that didn't help. He was a special blessing for them, but if, when you go and read the story, Samson was the kind of kid who told his parents, I want that, and oh my word, don't you dare say no. Come. Anybody know other people with kids like that? <laughs> <laughs> Right? I want that. I want her. I want this. I want that. Yes, I'll go into debt, whatever. Just, it didn't help. It fed into that self-centered nature 
that he eventually grew up into as an adult. So Samson did whatever he wanted to. The Philistines feared him. God called him to deliver the nation of Israel against the Philistines. You say, well, then he's doing a good job. No, the problem is he was so arrogant and self-centered and so grumpy and that even his own people feared him. He was there to protect them, but they feared him. He was, he was a narcissist. But you see, here's the thing. God still had a purpose on his a calling and a purpose for his life. When God's word speaks, it needs to happen. And so God says to Samson, I love you too much to keep you the way that you are. My purpose upon your life has not come to an end because you've turned out the way you have. Come on, that's a word for somebody. My purpose and my calling on your life has not come to an end because you've made the choices and the decisions in life that you have. I'm still gonna, you see, this is how we sometimes think about God. He, he gives us a plan and a purpose and for our kids, and then one day, something happens. We make wrong choices, we, we go on a different path, and God stands back and goes, oh my word, what are you doing? It is why the Bible says, that before the beginning of time, God already knew his plan of salvation for mankind. Because God didn't put Adam and Eve in the garden, and then one day pitched up there, and here's the two of them eating this apple thing. What are you doing? No. He knew they would. He knew they would. He knew they would be in that place. He already had a plan in place. God had a plan for Samson's life. Do you know that God has a plan for your life? So let's get back to, or let, let me show you one verse in Judges. Judges chapter 16, verse 21. His whole life leads up to this point where he marries the wrong girl. She discovers his Achilles heel. It's in his hair. She cuts his hair. His strength goes. He loses the gift. And this is what happens. So the Philistines captured him. Look at this. They gouged out his eyes. I want you to see this, excuse the pun. <laughs> they, they gouged out his eyes. I want you to see the misery that this guy is becoming. They took him to Gaza, a place away from home, a place away from familiarity, a place away from peace, where his people were, where he was bound with bronze chains. He was made to be useless, powerless, and forced to grind grain in the prison. He was forced to grind grain in the prison. I want you to see this. I think there's a lesson to be learned from Samson's life, and it's this one. The legacy of the man whose gift was greater than his character will inevitably include the details of his spectacular descent. Do you know, I, I don't have this on a wall somewhere at my house because it's in my heart. I'm, I de remind myself of that every single day, especially in those moments when I stand before God and I say, can, can, can we fast forward this a little bit? Come on, how many of you know? Can, can, can we just put a little bit more juice on the pedal, hello? God says, be careful, be careful that you don't run ahead of yourself because when your character cannot sustain your gift, you are going to be in trouble. You're going to be in trouble. Here's the good news. Greatness awaits on the other side of the grind. At this moment, Samson didn't realize this. He didn't know this. He didn't understand it. For him, like Paul the Apostle, he thought it was the end. I'm just going through this motion. I'm going to die here on this wheel. God says, just you, but there's some, your greatest moment is going to be on the other side of this grind. So he has it. Why am I in the grind? You see, the wait prepares us for what we are waiting for. Our purpose, our destiny, our calling, the fulfillment of what God has for us. He has a question, though. How long 
are we supposed to wait in the waiting season? How many of you know want the answer to that question? You know what I've said to God every single time I've asked God that question? How long is the wait? God's response to me is something like this. How long is a piece of string? I don't know. The Bible is very quiet on these things. Every time we get into a character in the Bible that needed to wait, that needed to exercise patience, there's this, there's this unfamiliarity with the time periods. How long? Let me ask you a question. How long would you expect a doctor to wait patiently before you allow them to open you up at your body and to start working inside? How, how long would you like them to wait? Well, it's... If, if, they, if they start at grade R, it's going to be 12 or 13 years, right? Then it's another seven or eight years later. So you're looking at a minimum of 20 years. By the time they've done 20 years, you're not cutting me open. You can check me out, but you're not putting a scalpel to my body. Let's give it another five or 10 years before you put me under and cut me open, right? Because can somebody say amen, or am I just being paranoid here? How long is the wait? Let me ask you a question. Do you know what the difference is between the gestation period of a fly and an elephant? Do you know? Do you, the, gestation, the gestation period of a fly is like seven days. Did you know that? Seven days. Little flies. <laughs> An elephant, on the other hand, is how long? Somebody tell me. Two years. 24 months. Human beings, only nine months. An elephant, 24 months. Yes, the moral. Listen to me. This is very important. The bigger the baby, the longer the pregnancy. So why do I have to wait so long? Be patient. Be patient. Why do I have to wait so long for him? Come on. I need a sister out there going, yes, please, Lord. <laughs> well, then God says, have you checked your shopping list that you gave me? <laughs> wait patiently. He's coming, she's coming, the breakthrough is coming, that raise is coming, that promotion is coming. Come on, clarity is coming. Your, the fulfillment of your purpose is coming. It is going to happen, but you need to wait patiently. And it doesn't help when we see people around us get their breakthroughs, right? And God says, but you're not them. You're not them. It doesn't look the same. Don't compare. Don't look at people. Don't look at the thing. Don't look at the breakthrough. Don't look at the money that you need. Those who wait on the Lord, those who wait on the Lord, not the breakthrough, shall have their strength renewed in the waiting. Let's go back to our verse. Judges 16. So the Philistines captured him, gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza where he was bound with bronze chains and forced to grind grain in the prison. How do I know that I may be going through a season of waiting? This is what I've discovered. The waiting will often feel dark and lonely. You know, when I've gone through those seasons, my, my natural inclination is to interpret it as God is punishing me. You know what I'm talking about? It's dark, it's lonely. It's like, it's like, it's like I can't read the word. I can't get revelation. I don't know. It's my, my, my prayer life is almost non-existent. It's like there's nothing there. It's like God says, what am I, have you forsaken me? Have I done something wrong? Is God punishing me? God says, no, 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 no. You're in a place of waiting. I'm preparing you like I prepared Samson, like I prepared uh, Joseph, like I prepared Paul the Apostle, so many other people. You're in a place of being prepared. A couple of weeks ago, 
I spoke about the season in the valley that prepares us for the mountain. Samson found himself in a valley like this. It was dark and it was lonely, but it was necessary. Why? Because the most significant moment of his life was waiting for him on the other side of the grind. But he didn't know it yet. He didn't know it yet. See, in the dark and lonely seasons, authenticity, uh, integrity, humility is produced in us. It's the characteristics of Christ. Samson's physical sight fed into his lusts and his greed. So God needed to remove his eyes. His public persona and his attractive physique fed into his arrogance and his self-centered sinful nature. So God had to isolate him away from the crowd. He goes, ooh, here comes Samson, here comes Samson. No, no, he's now in a dark, lonely place. Does anybody here know what I am talking about? And in that place, we think it's the end. I've missed it. I've, God gave me a shot and I blew it. God says, no. By making that statement, you're assuming that I was surprised by the moment when you blew it. I was not. Your best, best moment is still waiting for you on the other side of the grind. For Samson, things needed to change. Why? Because our purpose can be ex before our purpose can be exposed in public places, our character needs to be formed in private patience. Let's, let's go back to the whole sex before marriage thing a little bit, just to give you some context. Is it... Is that okay? Well, for one or two of you that's married, all the married couples are going, yeah, no, no, go there, go there, go there. <laughs> you see, here's, here's the thing. Before you can celebrate your wedding day in public, the fruit of the Spirit needs to be developed during your single days in private. Isn't that true? Now, besides the fact that sex before marriage has all kinds of mental and emotional and spiritual and even physical consequences, I want you to see this. The Christ-like character that gets developed in us in a, season, in a season of abstinence is patience. Patience. You see, it's the ability to wait patiently. Wait for what? Wait to have sex? No. Go back to Isaiah. To wait for the Lord. The reason why you're impatient is because you're waiting for sex. Your, your focus is on something that you want, something as material as you are. Isaiah says that's your problem. That's why you're impatient. You, you've got your focus on something else, you need to be waiting for the Lord. Why do we wait for the Lord? Because the Lord knows you. He knows you inside and outside. He knows when you are ready for every season in your life. And in the moment when he says wait, he says so not because he is uh, this brutish deity who wants to control your life and, and, and suck all the, all, all the joy out of it. No, it's because he's your father. And he knows when you are ready for every season in life and when you are not. And in the meantime, this is what he asks. Wait patiently. Wait patiently. You see, this is, uh, when, when I thought about the word patient, I thought, patience, thought we need to define what patience is. And then I thought to myself, you know what I need to do? I need to go to find a definition that's outside of the Bible. Because, you know, I've heard some people say, you know, everything you preach about just comes from the one book. So I thought, okay, well, let's go to the Oxford Dictionary. Let's see how the Oxford Dictionary defines patience. Look at this. The Oxford Dictionary says, patience is the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, problems, or suffering without becoming annoyed or anxious. 
I went to the Bible. I couldn't find a definition as spiritual as this. <laughs> now you know why that tension is there in moments of patience. Because it's hard. But you know it needs to be done. Your father taught you well. Those who wait on the Lord, it, it's like, it's like uh, I've, I thought about this and I thought, you know what, when, when, we, when we raise our kids, we all tell them, do not climb into the cars of strangers, right? Right? Do not, go and, do not entertain long conversations with strange people, okay? And so you, here's your kid, you've taught them and they're waiting outside the school and this car pulls up and this door opens and there's this big smile inside the stranger going, come on, climb in the car, I'll take you home. What do you, what's, your, what's your kid going to say? No, I'm not climbing. Why not? I'm waiting for my dad. I'm waiting for my mom. Right? What if this guy says, but my car is nicer than your dad's car. And look, I've got a whole bag of sweeties inside the car. Come on, the, I, I'm on the... the the penny needs to drop now. That's all we go. Okay, well, okay. Man. No, no. If you taught your kid well, they go, no, it's not about, you see, I'm not waiting on your sweets. I'm not waiting on your fancy car. I'm not waiting on your great grin and your smile and your whatever. I'm waiting for my dad. I'm waiting for my mom. Those who wait on the Lord, not for the things, shall renew their strength. So think about this. You cannot grow and develop your capacity to wait patiently when you're single. Or let me, let me put it this way. What makes you think that if you can't learn to say no when you're single, that you'll be able to say no when you're married? Just a thought. Somebody once told me, if you can't say no to a cupcake, that's metaphorically and physically speaking, If you can't say no to a cupcake, you can't say no. Here's another question. So is this waiting active or is it passive? Let's go back to Isaiah. Those who wait for the Lord. I went and looked up the Hebrew word that Isaiah used to describe this word wait, I made an incredible discovery. You see, we, we think of this waiting as just like this, especially when you're a driven person. You know when you're like a laid back personality, there's certain parts of the Bible that's like awesome. There's like, yeah, let's just wait, man. Let's wait. Let's wait. You know, but when you're just driven, driven, come on, let's go someplace. It's like, no, don't tell me that. But this is what I discovered. This is the Hebrew word that Isaiah used. It's the word kavah. This is what it means. Look here. To bind together, collect, and gather with patient expectation. Does that sound like somebody who's sitting on a couch watching Netflix all day? No, it's not. It's active. It's intentional. There's movement all the time. It's a kind of waiting that says, I'm getting up in the morning. I'm getting up early. I'm going to wash my face. I'm going to get dressed. I'm going to get ready for life. I'm going to do what I need to do for my family. I'm going to do my job with excellence. I'm going to make a difference in the lives of people. All in a season of waiting for something that my heart is waiting for whether it's a spouse or a breakthrough or a healing or whatever it is, I'm waiting. But while I'm waiting, I do not sit around and mope about it because my focus is on my Father. I'm waiting for the Lord. The waiting is not passive. I'm coming into land now. So you can give me some nice background music. Let's just wait patiently. I'm going to wait for that nice music to come, and then I'm going to carry on preaching. We need to practice these things, right? We can't just like, there you go, there you go, there you go. <laughs> Can you feel the anointing? Everything I say from here on, it just like feels like more spiritual. It's like, your shoe, man. Can you feel that? It's just like, you didn't know what I said now, but it's just, listen to this. Listen to this. 
See, Samson had to learn to submit, waiting patiently, and in that place of waiting, to submit every single day to the tedious and painful and mediocre routines of everyday discipline. Come on, have you ever been there? Maybe you're there right now. You're in that place, you say, God, I, I know my life is full of blessing, but I just, I need a breakthrough. I need something. I need to get, I need to see movement. And God says, don't, don't get impatient. Don't get impatient. Don't get impatient. Just wait. Just wait. It's coming. Come on. Somebody needs to know in this place. It's coming. It's coming. God has not forsaken you. God has not forsaken you. And yes, you had a bumpy ride and you, you, you had a big fall and you, you made some mistakes and now you're in a place of waiting. Ah, go speak to Moses. Oh, my word. Can you imagine this guy? He's highly educated. Highly educated. He can speak multiple languages. He was, he was taught in the, in the courts of rulers, and now he's in this place where he's looking after people's sheep. Oh, my word. Samson, Samson, you were such a mighty man. You had so much potential. The gift on you was absolutely amazing, and then you blew it. You became all self-centered. You made life about you and your ministry and your calling and your gift. And then you plunged. Samson, just in the tediousness of every single day, God is preparing you. God is preparing you. He's preparing your character so your gift can be restored. Come on, we always hear, God, look, there's a reason behind the character. The character empowers the gift. When the gift gets bigger than the character, there's a problem. But when the character grows and the gift comes behind it and is led by the character of Christ in us, greatness begins to happen. Samson, we need to build up your character so we can restore your gift to you. God did not make a mistake when he placed that gift upon your life at the start. But you need to be patient. And just keep, don't despise the grind every day. Find the joy in it. So you can't see good thing for you. You begin to see with your spiritual eyes. Exercise your discernment. Don't despise the grind. Because greatness lies on the other side of that grind. Let me show you something. Judges 16, verse 22. The very next verse. Look at this. But before long. Come on, somebody say, before long. I don't know how long that is, but before long. Before long, his hair began to grow back. Come on, Samson. Your gift is starting to come back to you again. Before long. I have a word for somebody here today. Be patient in the grind. Because before long, your gift will be restored to you as your character is grown. Those who wait shall renew their strength. And those who are strengthened will patiently wait. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we come before you this, today, this morning, as vulnerable people. We're not going to come to you with any pretense like we sometimes do, trying to put our best foot forward as if you don't know. We don't come before you as employees come before an employer. Or followers come before a leader. Or... religious people come before a God we come before you as children before a father with absolute transparency absolute humility and great vulnerability we come before you with open arms so you can see us as we are 
And we know that you will not be angered. You will not be grieved. But you will welcome us with open arms. And Lord, this is our confession. A bold prayer. Will you help us to be patient? Will you help us to keep our focus off the things we so desperately want in life and just continue to see you? And that your promise to us is true as we seek the kingdom of God and its righteousness. All the other things we want will be added to us in due time. Not long, but in due time. And in this place of waiting, Lord, I pray, will you fill us with your spirit? Give us peace in that place. Help us just to stop for a moment before we make that, that incredibly big life decision. And just take a moment to look at our Father. Say, Lord, are you in this? Give me peace about this. Lord, allow us to be people of the kingdom of heaven who walk not by our feelings, but walk in faith, walk in patient faith. We thank you for your incredible love and your kindness towards us. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Was that helpful? I'm looking forward to bringing the final message in the series to you next week, Sunday. Until then, I hope you have incredible discussions in your life groups. And uh, this week, be patient with one another. Let's be patient with one another. Love you madly. Go in peace. Mwah. I hope that you were encouraged by that powerful message. If you'd like to take your next step, head over to our website where you'll be able to fill in a response card. If you'd like more information on our resources, upcoming events and programs, head over to our website as well where you'll find more information on that. Look, we hope to see you next week.